Okay, thanks, Guillaume. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm really happy to talk at the mega seminar. I think it's kind of a unique seminar which blends perfectly mathematicians and, uh, and physicists. And uh, so today I'll try to give a physicist perspective on the problems related to freedom determinants, exact solutions to KPZ, and uh, some integral differential generalization of the kind of the uh, equations. So I think, as you could guess from the title, there will be a few protagonists uh, in my talk today. Okay? So my talk will be divided in three parts. So on the, on the first part, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the cardinal partisan equation, its exact solutions, and some intriguing connections uh, that were established between the KPZ, random matrices, and, uh, and the part of the equations. And I want you to take this as kind of a story that will allow me to introduce some tools uh, especially related to freedom determinants uh, that I will need in the second and third part uh, of my talk. So using this first part as an excuse to introduce the tools, I will then slightly shift to talk about freedom determinants and kind of universal uh, integral differential uh, equations verified uh, in this setting. And in the third part, I'll give an application of the framework I will just have to develop before. So uh, let's start it. Because I'm a physicist, uh, let's start to do a little bit of, uh, of physics. So let's back to the origin of the, the Cardar-Parisian equation in the 80s. So originally, Cardar, Parisi, and Zeng were interested in the problem of the growth of, um, of the growth of bacteria, for instance, in a medium. So imagine that you're taking a piece of paper, and on one of the edge, you're just dropping some bacteria, let's say even even. And if the paper has the same composition everywhere, if all the bacteria are exactly the same, if the if biology is not stochastic, if you don't have any perturbation from uh, outside then you would expect the growth to be some kind of linear, but especially the front of the growth of your bacteria on the paper will be a straight line. But of course, uh, you'll see exactly what I want to come to. Uh, biology stochastics, uh, the bacteria will not all be the same. The paper will have some different composition everywhere. You can have uh, influence from the temperature, from the pressure outside. You can have some noise. So in practice, the growth will be somehow linear, but the front of the interface will be really, really, really rough. And you'll have some stochasticity uh, appearing there. And the work of uh, Kadar Parisi and Zang in the 80s was to found a model to actually describe uh, this phenomenon. And they came up with the now celebrated equation in uh, 1985, the Kadar Parisi equation, which describes the growth of a hate field, H of X and T, so the hate at the position X and a time T. This equation is comprised of a few terms. So the first two terms is the standard. Uh, heat equation, if you want. You have a first nonlinear correction uh, that comes from the square of the gradient. And finally, you have an additive perturbation, which is a standard white noise. And since the equation uh, appeared in 1985, a lot of work has been devoted uh, to it, and it has actually created a new field for this uh, KPZ University class. Uh, it created uh, new efforts both in probability and combinatorics in physics and quantum mechanics, up to the point where Martin Harry got the Fields Medal in 2014, and he also had the Breakthrough Prize in mathematics uh, a few months ago. So now we have uh, we have the KPZ equation, but what do we do with it? As we study a growth problem, we have to also consider the geometry. And in particular, for the case of interest to me, there are two types of geometries that you can consider. Either you study the problem in a full space, or you study the problem in a half space. So in the full space, imagine that my piece of paper uh, goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, so the bacteria grow everywhere. In the half space, uh, you would consider the problem near a wall, near a boundary, and thus you'll have some interactions between the boundary of, uh, of, your, of the problem uh, and the growth of the interface. And in the case of uh, the full space, more particularly, there are three geometries of interest. The first one being called the flat one, so just the original height is the same everywhere, it's completely flat. The second one is the droplet initial uh, condition, which is more or less an hour wedge. So basically you put all the bacteria in one spot and then it grows uh, on top of this. And that's why it's sometimes called a droplet because the front of the interface then resembles uh, a droplet. And the third one is the Brownian initial condition that I just plotted uh, on the right um, of the screen. So it's, it is a double-sided Brownian motion uh, with a Brownian motion on the left of the origin and another one on the right that are independent. And I consider these Brownian motions with uh, drifts, uh, which are here called uh, W. And of course, when the drift is really, really large, you find back the, the droplet initial condition. 
these three initial conditions of, our, are of interest because uh, when one can actually solve entirely the equation with uh, these initial conditions, and I'll come back later to, uh, to this, and also because the Brownian initial condition, if you take the drift going to zero, is the stationary initial condition uh, to the KPZ equation. Now, if you want to study the problem in a half space, of course, because you have a boundary, you have to add an extra parameter. So in general, there is one boundary condition that people consider is the so-called fixed slope boundary condition where you fix the slope of your interface to some value capital A uh, at the origin. And depending on the value, you can think that the wall is kind of sticky, attractive, or, or repulsive. For people that, are, that usually study uh, PDs uh, from the point of view of integrability, um, let me tell you that when we consider the equation mathematically, we don't really consider directly the height h, but it's exponential, and therefore this boundary condition uh, becomes a Robin boundary condition, which is kind of familiar for the people uh, that study uh, integrable PDs. Okay, so now that we have this geometry of interest, this initial condition, what can we do? Maybe we can try to solve the uh, KPZ equation exactly. So let me tell you a bit of history about this. So the first solutions, explicit solutions to the equation appeared around uh, 2010, in 2010 actually, uh, first for the droplet initial condition, kind of at the same moment by five groups, by Sasamoto and Spohn, by Calabres, Lodusal and Rosso, by Dots and Co, and by Amir Cohen and Kestel. And I'll come back a bit later on some results that Amir Cohen and Kestel brings. And after the droplet case, some other conditions were, uh, were studied, the flat one, then the Brownian one, uh, first from physicists, then uh, more rigorously by mathematicians. Concerning the results of the high space, it's a bit more recent because there are some technicalities that appear in this problem that were not present in the full space case. And that's why so far only two initial conditions were studied, the droplet one and the Brownian one. And historically, people needed to consider specific boundary conditions, a uh, specific value of the parameter A, first plus infinity is zero, and then minus one half. And more recently, uh, we've been able to generalize this to a larger range uh, up to the solution uh, we found for the Brown initial condition with uh, Guillaume Barco and Pierre Le Dussal um, a few months ago. So I just told you that we can solve explicitly the KPZ equation, but what does it actually mean? So I'll give you a specific uh, example uh, right away. So let's take the case of the KPZ equation in the full space, uh, starting from a droplet initial condition. So your original height is an R wedge, and because the interface uh, grows kind of linearly in time on average, uh, we'll study the height of the interface at the origin, so h of zero and t, and we'll just subtract the, the linear contribution. And the main result that was obtained in 2010 is the following. If you take the generating function of the exponential of the kpz height, uh, then this is equal to a freedom determinant. A uh, freedom determinant that is an object that appears quite generally in uh, random matrix theory. And with, within this freedom determinant, you have two objects. The first one is uh, the operator uh, that has the airy kernel. So the airy kernel is, uh, is, uh, is defined as usual from the uh, integral of the product of two airy functions. So we can see that there is an additive structure in these uh, airy functions. And this uh, every kernel is equipped with a measure sigma, which I call the Fermi factor, or it's a logistic function that takes uh, the form uh, written. And a first, uh, a first striking uh, observation is that this uh, this result, this uh, this solution, directly relates uh, random matrix theory and the solution to KPZ. Uh, firstly, because if you take the infinite time limit uh, of this equation, so if you look at the growth of the KPZ interface at really really large time. If you take the same limit in the freedom determinant, you actually um, obtain the freedom determinant uh, for the Tracy rhythm uh, distribution for the Gaussian unitary ensemble. Meaning that the KPZ height at the origin uh, will have fluctuations of the other t to the one third, and the fluctuations will have exactly the same distribution as the largest algorithm value of a random matrix. And this is kind of surprising because the, these problems are a priori not related at all. The exponent of the fluctuations, this t to the one third, is really characteristic of the KPZ universality class. So you would expect if you had something which was not correlated that you would obtain a square root of t, but the one third here is really characteristic uh, of, uh, of the physics. 
And another observation we can uh, we can obtain from this, and that's where I want to come back to the results of Amir Cohen and Castell, is that there is an extra interpretation to this freedom determinant. So if you take the freedom determinant obtained at infinite time, so just the regular determinant of the kernel, it was shown by Tracy and Widom in the 90s that if you take the second derivative of the logarithm of this freedom determinant, you obtain a function uh, q, and this function solves the Perlevé two equation, uh, which is a nonlinear uh, ordinary differential equation with some prescribed uh, boundary condition at infinity. And now the results of Amir Cohen and Castell is that if you take the freedom determinant arising at finite time for the solution of KPZ, once again, if you take its logarithm and you differentiate it, you obtain um, the, the L2 norm, uh, the L2 weighted norm of a function Q uh, that depends on a parameter T, which is the time of uh, the KPZ dynamics. And this time the function Q does not verify directly a differential equation, but in integral differential equation, which is written just below. And you see from this equation that if you take the measure, the derivative of the measure sigma prime to be a delta function, then this integral differential boils down to the standard part of it equation. So all of this is really surprising because just from this particular solution of KPZ, you already have connections with Panlevé and with uh, random matrices. This is uh, kind of surprising and that actually uh, triggered a lot, of, a lot of development research and uh, connections to create. More recently, there has been some work from uh, Castell and Remenic uh, in math and biology design and physics to also relay this integral differential uh, Panlevé equation to the KP equation, which is another integrable differential equation arising uh, in uh, fluid mechanics. Okay, so that was what I wanted to say for the full space problem. So now let me tell you, uh, let me give you some insight about uh, the half space problem. So consider the problem on the half line. Uh, in this case, you have this uh, boundary condition uh, near the wall at x equals zero, where you fix the slope of your interface. And uh, first, let's consider a Brownian uh, initial condition. So your interface is a Brownian motion with some drift parameterized by this parameter capital B. And one of the first results we obtained uh, with Guillaume and Pierre is that there is kind of a surprising uh, symmetry arising in the solution of the equation. Meaning that if you study the KPZ height at any time t at the origin, so at x equals zero, then you can permute the parameters a and b and it doesn't change the distribution of the solution. That's kind of surprising because it's a symmetry between the initial condition and the boundary condition. And you can ask uh, yourself whether this is something specific to KPZ, specific to the KPZ universality class maybe, or whether this is something uh, more general in integrable nonlinear systems. And my take today is, I think this is a bit more general. And if you study integrable uh, partial differential equations like the nonlinear Schrodinger one, it should be possible to find uh, also uh, such symmetries. But I don't think it has been uh, explored um, yet. So this is a first, uh, a first uh, property. And the second one is actually uh, the connection between the half space uh, problem and uh, random matrices. So now we'll specify uh, the problem not to have the brown initial data, but the droplet one. So you just take the drift of the, the brown and go into infinity. And if you look at the solution at infinite time uh, for the KPZ height, you have a really nice phase transition arising depending on the value of the parameter A. So there's a critical value, uh, which is A equal to minus one half. And above minus one half, the fluctuation of the KPZ height at infinite time are of a Tracy with them, a GSC type. So meaning they're related to a random matrices of symplectic type. For the critical value A uh, equals minus one half, uh, the trace the fluctuations are of Tracy rhythm GOE type. So for the for the orthogonal ensemble. And finally, if you go uh, to the values S less than minus one half, uh, a lot of things changes. First of all, uh, the velocity or the average velocity of the interface changes. That's why you have this A plus one half uh, squared that enters the numerator. The order of magnitude of uh, the fluctuations also changes. It's not t to the one third anymore, but t to the one half. And the fluctuations now are not related to random matrices, but they are purely Gaussian. I know that some people in the audience are kind of used to study spiked random matrices. And I think that you will recognize that this phase transition is actually the same one as the Bagenaro-Pesce 
phase transition for the largest eigenvalue of a rank one spike J symmetrix. So this is a nice observation. Uh, and to me, this is an open problem to understand why you have this connection uh, between the two. If uh, anyone has uh, an answer for me, I'd be really happy. And this actually uh, gives us uh, some more intriguing connections between all these uh, problems arising in integrable uh, probability. So, and apart from this uh, phase transition, just for the droplets uh, initial condition, we've been able uh, with Pierre and Guillaume to construct uh, the more general phase diagram uh, for the solution in the Haas space, where you consider the Brown initial, condi uh, Brown initial condition with any drift larger than minus one half and any boundary uh, condition um, uh, also uh, bigger than minus one half. And in this case, we have found that the fluctuations of the solution at infinite time are mostly uh, GAC everywhere. On the axis where B is equal to minus one half or A is equal to minus one half, uh, you have uh, GOE fluctuations uh, once again. And at the critical point where both parameters are equal to minus one half, there's a new distribution that appears. And this distribution is actually the stationary distribution for the KPZ equation uh, in the half space. And to make things even more uh, intriguing, uh, we have found uh, with Pierre uh, and Guillaume the expression of this stationary distribution in terms of uh, GUE and GOE Tracy Wim distribution, which you can also express in terms of Pandovic transcendence. And for the formula we have found in a half space, uh, which is this function f of s, it is closely related uh, to the stationary distribution uh, found in a full space for the KPZ problem, which is uh, the celebrated by Crane's distribution. And as you can see, only uh, an F1 function uh, adds up uh, in the half space. And apart from the work we did with uh, Guillaume and Pierre, there has, been some, uh, there has been a lot of work also from uh, the group of BTA, Ferrari, and Occelli to study the KPZ problem in half space, but from, from the point of view of the KPZ university class. And although we've uh, restricted only with Pierre and Guillaume to the distribution at the origin, so at x equals zero only, uh, Betea Ferrari and Occelli have studied the crossover when you take a position away from the wall and because when you go far away from the wall you're supposed to find back the full space uh, solution as you don't feel the boundary condition they have studied the crossover between uh, the distribution uh, between the two functions f and f by coins. and that's that's what I want to say for the KPZ and the key points of all this uh, first part of the story is that there are intriguing connections and there are many interesting phenomena and that's why the research in this area is going to last uh, for a bit of time um, I think and since I try to motivate all these connections and I try to show that all these connections arise through freedom determinants I'll now uh, take the occasion to uh, raise a few open questions uh, related to KPZ and freedom determinants and then I'll uh, shift uh, to uh, construct a framework around the freedom determinants that appear. So in the KPZ community, we've observed that the generating function of the KPZ height is determinantal for a few initial conditions or a few points in space. So first, is this relation more general or is it really specific to this particular points people have studied so far? In, half, in the half space, uh, in terms of boundary conditions, people have studied so far only the fixed low boundary conditions. So would it be possible to find other boundary conditions that would yield a uh, determinantal uh, structure behind this and therefore that would yield a connection to random matrices? And finally, is there a more general relation or connection between uh, random matrix theory and uh, the exact solution of KPZ that we could have through freedom determinants? So since these freedom determinants are so paramount and important in my work, I'll devote the rest of uh, my talk to them. So in practice, what we have observed in KPZ and in many problems is that you have freedom determinants uh, with a really particular structure that appear. In particular, you have a freedom determinant of an operator which has a kernel of a particular additive type. So let's say you want to define a function A, which can be an array function or a Gaussian function. You endow it with an additive structure. That's why you have this function A of X plus R plus S. You multiply it twice, and that way you create uh, a kernel KS of uh, X and Y. And this type of uh, kernel and of freedom determinant appears uh, in many, many, many problems. In linear statistics of Ginebra elliptic Gaussian random matrix spectra, in the full counting statistics uh, and entropy of free fermions, in multi-critical fermions at the edge of interacting systems, in the exact solutions of KPZ, of course, 
but also if, for people interested in integrability and human habit problems, it appears in the Zakhar of Shabbat systems, in the theory of solitons, in uh, riemann Herbert and inverse scattering methods, and also because most people here study probability, it appears in determinantal point processes. And from the point of view of differential equations, it appears in the Pandavi 2 hierarchy, and I will come back later to this. So now that I try to motivate the appearance of these objects, let's try to define a framework uh, for, uh, uh, for the rest of the talk. So the framework will be the following. I'll define some real parameter S, uh, I will need also a smooth function A, which you can take, you know, to be a Gaussian function or the Erie function or the Percy function. And the only constraint is that this function has to vanish exponentially fast towards plus infinity. From this function A, I want to create an operator AS, which is of additive of or Henkel type. Uh, and from this uh, operator, I want to create a kernel KS, which is exactly the one you would have with the Erie kernel, but generalized to any kind of function. And equipped with this operator, I'll be interested in the rest of the talk uh, in two objects. The first one is the freedom determinant of uh, this kernel KS that has this particular structure. And the second determinant is uh, the same, but uh, equipped with a measure sigma that is reminiscent of the finite time solutions uh, to the KPZ uh, equation. And for this measure sigma, which can be some, uh, some kind of probability measure, the only constraint I will need is that the functions go from zero to some value between zero and one and the asymptotics are reached exponentially fast. Okay, it turns out that for all the problems where these freedom determinants appeared, a number of results have appeared but on a really particular and other basis and my point here for uh, the next few slides will be to generalize these results and present to you uh, uh, the, the way they generalize. So for this, I will need to define a few more objects. In particular, I will need to define a set of functions indexed by an integer p. So I will need two functions, qp and up, that are defined as follows. Uh, they're defined by the multiplication of uh, the resolvent of my operator ks, which is multiplied by the p derivative of uh, the operator as, constructed just from the p derivative of my function a. And I will constrain the really left and the really right variables of this uh, operator to be equal to zero as is expressed in the integral representation so just below. And for the functions uh, up, it will be more or less constructed in the same way as the qp, but I will need an extra operator as to the right. So you want to ask me, why do I need to define these functions? So first, these functions were introduced by Tracy and Whedon back in their original work, but only for small indices p. They were defined for p equals 0, 1, and 2. But as we'll see in the following, uh, these functions are actually required for uh, any p uh, an integer p. And the reason why they introduced this, these two functions is because if you take the freedom determinant, you take its logarithm and you differentiate it, then the first derivative gives you your function u naught, and the second derivative gives you uh, the square of your function uh, q naught multiplied by a minus sign. And this should be really reminiscent to the, to the solution of the KPZ equation related to the uh, freedom determinant of the Erie kernel and the Perlevé 2 uh, equation I mentioned in my first part. And on top of having this nice interpretation for, yes? Alexander, can, may, I, may I interrupt you? Uh, so I, I, I hope this is useful, but uh, so maybe these uh, notations with, with the brackets, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, so it's very common in physics, but maybe for, for the audience you, you could explain it uh, Perhaps a little bit in in the middle, for instance, for the in the definition of QP, you have in the middle you have a product of two operators uh, associated to a kernel, and and then you you apply it. Uh... Yeah. So so basically, so this uh, this uh, notations, this bracket delta, um, they're also written in the integral representation just below. So let's say you want to consider this uh, operator multiplication. So you multiply your operator which is the p derivative of um, as by the resolvent of the kernel. And this operator usually has two variables. Uh, it should be like a y and a z. And I constrain my right variable to be equal to uh, zero. So I'll, it's just a delta function uh, on the really uh, last variable. And it's the same on, on the left. So this operator uh, as uh, uh, differentiated p times uh, is supposed to have arguments like AP of X plus Y plus S, and I take the X to be equal to zero. 
So I really constrained all these variables to be equal to zero. But if you don't want to have these bracket notations, just take the integral representations. Okay, so hence the notation for, for the projector, uh, it's essentially a delta function. Uh... Uh, yes, it's a delta function. Um, so there's a question about, uh, is it clear that the operator is bounded by one? Uh, I'll take the hypothesis uh, that actually the operator is bounded by uh, one from above. But in all the cases of interest that appeared in the literature, it's always been the case. That's why uh, I'll, I'll just take this as an hypothesis. And the other reason to reduce this function on top of uh, having a nice relation to these freedom determinants is because they verify a universal hierarchy of equations. In the sense that if you take any integer p, you have the two following uh, differential uh, relations. So the derivative of qp with respect to s is equal to qp plus 1 minus q0 uh, up. And the derivative of uh, up with respect to s is equal to minus uh, q0 up. And I want to emphasize that this system, this differential system, is independent of the function a. So this is completely general. And maybe that's why you have all these universal uh, results that appear in many problems. And I know that some people in the audience are uh, more used to integrable systems and in particular to the zakharov shabat system. So I would like to say that this system is actually the zakharov shabat system uh, written in some kind of Laurent expansion. And in this zakharov shabat system, usually uh, when you have a Riemann-Helbig problem associated, you have, a Fourier, you have a reflection coefficient. And this reflection coefficient is actually the Fourier transform of A. And on top of having this universal hierarchy of uh, differential equations, you have also an infinite set of uh, conserved quantities in the sense that you can express all odd uh, indexed uh, functions u uh, by the u's and the q's with lower indices. And the fact that you have this infinite amount of uh, conserved uh, quantity means that you're dealing with an integrable uh, system. It turns out that both of these results were obtained in the context of multi-critical fermions by Ledoux, Salma, Jundar, uh, and Cher uh, a few years ago, but in the context of uh, functions A that are every function or high order every function. But uh, what I've showed is that this relation do not depend on the function uh, A, so it's a bit more universal. But as I said, as I wrote in the title of this uh, slide, it's not completely universal, it's quasi-universal. So if you take the, this differential hierarchy, you see that the equation on Q always raises the index. So from QP, you go to, Q, to QP plus one. From the concept quantities, you can lower the indices of U, but you'll never be able to lower the indices of Q. So from this set of equations, of course, you'll never be able to find a closed differential equation for any, for any of these functions. So there, there should exist a non-universal feature. And of course, the non-universal feature should depend on the function a. And in practice, one will need an extra equation, an extra relation, which I call the closure relation, which is an equation that relates uh, qn for a certain n uh, to the q's and u's of uh, lower indices. And that's where the explicit expression of uh, the function a will play a role. For the people that are used to also integrable systems, lax pairs for uh, PDEs, if you think of this uh, infinite set of uh, differential equations to be uh, one member of the lax pair, of course, the closure relation should be the other member of the lax pair. So it's not, uh, it's not surprising that uh, we're missing uh, another equation. And I will come back to this missing equation in a particular application uh, for the final of it to hierarchy uh, in the third part of my talk. And on top of uh, these functions having nice properties, uh, you can also manipulate them quite easily numerically. So they have some nice algebraic properties, so you can differentiate them, you can obtain relations, but you can also plug them, uh, plug them in Mathematica, for instance, uh, using methods derived from uh, Bornemann's method to uh, study freedom determinants. And I will give you uh, two, uh, short ex two small examples of the functions Q0, Q1, uh, U0, and U1 for two cases, the first one being the Airy case. So for the function A, I'll just define uh, I'll, it will just be uh, proportional to the uh, area function with a proportionality factor which is less than one. And as it, as it was known from the work of Tracy Widom and also uh, from the work on the point of A2 equation, there's a really uh, high dependence on the functions Q1, uh, Q0, Q1, and U0 on the parameter gamma here. If you take any parameter gamma less than one, the solution will be highly oscillatory. And uh, for gamma equal to one, it will diverge uh, quite fast. 
and this is uh, this is the case uh, for these first functions. Now, if you take the case of uh, the Gaussian function, so the Gaussian function is uh, the case that was considered recently in a paper by uh, Bike and uh, Bosner when they were looking at the real uh, elliptic ensemble. Uh, in this case, the functions q0, q1, u0, and uh, u1 do not have a high dependence on the parameter gamma, meaning that there is no oscillatory behavior or critical behavior that, uh, that appears. And if you want to evaluate uh, these four functions and any functions qp, uh, it's really easy uh, if you have uh, if you have these functions uh, ax, a of x. Okay. Um, all these results uh, that I told you were about these freedom determinants without any measure, but there were some kind of generalization of results that were obtained uh, beforehand. So let me give you maybe some uh, novelty. So the case of this freedom determinants arising with uh, some particular uh, measure. So once again, the motivation to study these freedom determinants are twofold, at least to me. The first one uh, being that it appears in the finite time solutions to the KPZ equation, and from the point of view of determinant point processes, it also appears in linear or multiplicative statistics of these point processes. Originally, I was looking at freedom determinant defined of, on L2 of R plus. So you see here that if I would take my measure sigma to be solely the projector into R plus, then I'm supposed to find all the results uh, I, I obtained before. So we'll check in the remaining of the talk that all the results that I obtained can be uh, can be reduced to the to the one I obtained before. And in this framework, the object I'll study are the following. So I'll once again define a function a, which I will equip with an additive structure, uh, and I will define the ks exactly in the same manner. But because now I have the interplay between the spaces uh, l2 of r and l2 of r plus, uh, on top of a s I will need to define its adjoint because it's not self-adjoint anymore. So the first step uh, to study this freedom determinant is the standard one, uh, which is using Sil Sylvester's identity to have a symmetry kernel. So originally on the left-hand side, I have this freedom determinant of the identity minus sigma AS, AS transpose, and I just take the AS transpose to go to the left of sigma, uh, which allows me to define uh, a symmetry kernel, which I call K2, which is AS transpose sigma AS. And from this kernel, you can repeat all the precedent uh, steps. So you can once again define uh, two functions, QP and UP, but now they have a different structure. Uh, UP is not, not a scalar function, but it's really an operator. And uh, QP is not a scalar function, it's uh, kind of a vector if you want. So in this case, I still take uh, my uh, operator AS differentiated P times, I multiply it by the resolvent of my symmetric operator K2. And in the case of QP, I constrain the really right variable to be equal to zero. So I just multiply it by a delta function uh, equal to zero. And for uh, UP, I don't constrain anything. Uh, so in this case, you have a much richer structure because you don't deal with scalar functions, but you deal with operator valued function. It can be either a vector uh, like structure or a matrix like structure. And we'll see that it actually brings some nice properties um, uh, to the system. And equipped with uh, these two functions, you can repeat all the steps. The first one being to relate the freedom determinant of interest to these functions. In this case, the first derivative of the logarithm of the freedom determinant is uh, the trace of the derivative of the measure times u naught. So once again, if you take sigma prime to be a delta functions, then you just find the result out obtained before. And now the second derivative is uh, an inner product of uh, the vector q naught weighted uh, by the, the derivative sigma prime. On top of having this nice, this nice relations, we also have a universal hierarchy of differential equations. But now it's not only a differential, it's integral differential. In the sense that the equation verified by QP uh, includes the product of UP sigma prime and uh, Q naught, and that's an operator product, so that's an integral product. And the derivative of uh, UP with respect to S is now a ranked one operator, and that can also bring some nice properties uh, to the problem. So you see that this generalizes uh, quite nicely what we obtained before. And on top of this uh, equation, uh, we also have a set of conservation laws uh, with these uh, new functions, but they are much richer than the one we had before. Before we had conservation laws that appeared only for the functions U, 
with odd indices, now we have uh, conservation laws for odd and even indices. And you can ask yourself the question, why do we have uh, more conservation laws in this case than in the other one? It turns out that if you take the second equation and you take sigma prime to be just a delta function, then the equation becomes trivially zero is equal to zero. So you don't have any information from this. So actually this tells you that studying this simple freedom determinant of the identity minus ks uh, loses a bit of information uh, compared to the, more, to the more general case. Okay. So uh, so now that we have uh, that we have obtained all of this, uh, what do we do with this? Uh, do we have any application? Is it just a general framework? What do we do uh, with this? And for this, I'll shift my uh, to the third part of my talk, which will give you some concrete applications to uh, to uh, to appreciate all these results. So the application I want to discuss uh, with you lies in the field of the Pinlevé equations, uh, and more particularly in the field of the Pinlevé uh, to hierarchy. So the Pinlevé to hierarchy, it's a sequence of uh, nonlinear differential equations, uh, which can be obtained by a certain recursion. The really first uh, equation of the hierarchy is the standard Pinlevé to hierarchy. And the second equation of the hierarchy is the one I just uh, gave you uh, below. It's a fourth-order differential equation. And a first observation I want uh, I, I want to discuss, and it will be late, useful for later on, is that you only see odd powers of Q appearing in this equation. and I'll give an explanation to this one. And what was uh, obtained in the past few years about this hierarchy is that the nth member of the hierarchy uh, is actually related uh, to freedom determinants. And all the framework I discussed before uh, completely applies to this equation. In particular, if you fix the choice of your function A to be a higher order A function, in particular, you take the solution of the following differential equation, you, de you differentiate uh, two n times your function, and it's supposed to be equal to x times a of x. Then the solution to the nth member of the hierarchy uh, is equal to the function uh, q naught uh, when you take the, the choice a equal to this uh, higher order function. And what was shown both in the physics and the math community by the Dussel, Majum Darcher, and then by Professor Clays and Giotti is that there's a one to one correspondence uh, between the Pinlevé to hierarchy and the freedom determinant of higher order area functions. Um, but one question that was not solved until then was about inhomogeneous freedom determinants. So let's say now I'm taking uh, an inhomogeneous freedom determinant, meaning that I have a measure sigma and I consider still the same function, which is a higher order area function. Do I find something that generalizes the Pinlevé uh, to hierarchy or uh, is the information completely lost? Uh, before giving you this information on the Pinlevé to hierarchy, uh, let me tell you that uh, on top of having uh, some interest for this model in uh, physics uh, in multicritical fermions or uh, concerning uh, riemann hilbert problems, there's been additional interest, uh, recent interest in combinatorics in a paper by uh, Betea, Boutier and uh, Walsh where they actually found a combinatoric model uh, where they had this high order function. And it also appeared in multi-critical uh, models in high energy physics a few decades ago uh, in the paper of Perriwal and Shevitz. Okay, so let's try to generalize uh, the results that were obtained by all these people. So uh, for this, I told you that uh, the differential uh, equations, the, this universal uh, differential equations uh, were missing a closure relation. So in the case of a high order function, um, which I wrote again on the on the top of the slide. You construct the kernel K2, which is symmetric, and you can construct all the set of functions, the Q0 until the Q2n. And it turns out that in this case, uh, Q2n verifies a closure relation, uh, which is written below, and which generalizes uh, the closure relation that were obtained by Tracy and Widom for the Ks n equal 1 and n equal to 2. And the case of uh, the Dussel, um, Majumdar, and Cher when the measure sigma is just a projector into R plus. And as you can see, this, uh, this uh, equation actually uh, conserves the structure of the different uh, operators. Since uh, U has a matrix-like uh, structure and Q is a vector-like structure, everything is a vector-like. Uh, and now equipped with disclosure relation, if you want to play with the differential, uh, all the differential relations, disclosure relation, and the uh, conservation laws uh, that we had, 
maybe we can obtain a completely closed equation for q naught, and that's actually possible as i'm going to show you right now let's start with the really really first uh, example let's take the example of the array function so in the case of the array function uh, you have the freedom determinant of the array kernel which has this measure sigma and it also appears uh, in the study of the KPZ equation with the droplet initial condition. And as I told you in the introduction, in this case, Amir, Corwin, and Castell in 2010 were able to relate the function Q0 uh, to an integral differential generalization of the Pandova 2 equation, which is written just below. And that's actually one of the motivations to try to go uh, beyond the result because they were already able to generalize uh, this. And the way they've done it in the past was actually through the same method uh, that I presented to you, but only they've introduced all the different functions for uh, the indices 0, 1, and 2, but no more. And now if you want to go beyond the results, uh, you can take the second uh, higher order every function, uh, which is the solution to the differential equation, uh, A differenti differentiated core times is equal to X times A of X. In the same fashion, you construct your freedom determinant with any measure sigma that has the right properties. You can construct the first function of uh, your hierarchy, so Q0, which is the operator AS multiplied by the resolvent, and you constrain the really right variable uh, to be equal uh, to zero. And then there's a generalization of the second member of the Pandovic hierarchy. So Q0 verifies a fourth order integral differential uh, equation. Which is uh, kind of uh, kind of involved, but it's, it has a really nice uh, property. Since Q naught is not a scalar function but a vector-like, you see that you can only obtain odd powers of Q everywhere. Why odd powers? Because you always need uh, two powers of Q to be inside the scalar product. For instance, this uh, this one, and you can uh, have it at any power. So at least you need an even powers of Q for all these inner products. And then you need an extra power to conserve the vector structure. So this tells you that if uh, all these results uh, hold for any of the equation in the Pandavit hierarchy, you'll only have odd powers, uh, odd powers of uh, of Q. And it's actually an indication also whether this equation can be related uh, somehow uh, to a freedom determinant because you need uh, this particular structure. So this is much richer than the standard uh, Pandavit two uh, case where you don't have any integral relation. Okay, so equipped with this result, let me tell you how to obtain it. It's quite cumbersome. And I think now uh, people like in the group of uh, Mattia Cafeso have obtained easier methods to obtain this equation. But let me tell you the way I obtained it. So it's quite long, but the procedure is the following. So because you need a fourth order differential equation, you need to differentiate uh, Q naught four times. And when you differentiate Q0 four times, because you increase the index of uh, Q by one every time, you find the function Q0, uh, Q4, sorry. And because the closure relation in this case is on the function Q4, then you can use your closure relation. From the closure relation, you use all the conservation laws. Uh, you use uh, some tricks by replacing uh, some functions by the differential relation. And at the end, after a few pages of calculation, you have this uh, integral differential uh, equation. And because this procedure is a bit long, um, it's not really scalable if you want to uh, if you want to uh, generalize uh, this to the third member, the fourth member, or any member of the hierarchy. So actually, uh, this construction raises uh, raises uh, a lot of questions. In particular, uh, as I uh, wrote in the uh, introduction to the Pandova hierarchy. Uh, all these equations are written by recursion. So there's an operator that brings an, equ an equation to the, to the next one. And this operator has since uh, not been constructed uh, yet. I know it's work uh, in progress uh, from the group of uh, Mattia, but at least it has not been, uh, been published yet. And to, to maybe uh, summarize and discuss a little bit of this, uh, all these results, uh, all these connections I tried to present today they were uh, were through uh, freedom determinants, and actually uh, these freedom determinants are at the interface of many, many, many problems in probability. They arise in random matrices. They arise in nonlinear differential equations. For instance, uh, the Ablovitzka-Newell-Segur uh, system 
comprising the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, comprising the KDV and KDV uh, equation. They also appear in the Penlevé uh, equations hierarchy, and not only for Penlevé uh, 2, but also for Penlevé 3 and Penlevé uh, 5 through the Bessel kernel. And it also appears in a nonlinear Fourier transform uh, that is uh, somehow related to uh, the inverse scattering uh, problem. Because these objects appear everywhere, because there is so much universal structure po popping out out of this, we can ask the question whether there is something else uh, beyond that. And to motivate this, maybe uh, let me give you uh, let me give you uh, a few open problems that some of them are nowadays solved but not published. Some of them are not entirely uh, solved. Is that um, I told you that in the case of uh, regular uh, the normal Friedel determinant without any measure, the differential uh, set of equations were related to the zakharov shabat system, which is a lax pair of many integrable uh, problems. But in the case of the freedom determinant equipped with a measure, no one has so far generalized the Zakharov Shabbat system to an operator valued one. So this would allow, for instance, to study all the integrable uh, PDEs in an integral differential uh, way. Also, the, the case of the freedom determinant with uh, two measures has not been uh, covered uh, so far. Um, you could think of having two different measures, uh, sigma and mu, and then defining again these different functions and uh, operators, uh, qp and up, and having a more general set of uh, equations. In the problem, I considered the function a was a real function, and uh, it was a more or less sapphire joint. But you could go either to the Hermitian case, where you would have uh, the kernel ks, which is a times uh, a uh, conjugate. You could also think of having two different operators, uh, AS and a BS that both have an additive structure. And uh, even beyond the additive structure, you could consider kernels that are close to the Bessel kernel with multiplicative structures. Um, on, on top of that, for people that are interested in, uh, in integrable uh, problems and that study the Zakharov Shabbat system, uh, there is a mapping um, actually that exists from uh, a set of function Q and a related function a that would uh, that would uh, give the correspondence between any function and maybe a freedom determinant of representation and this kind of bijection of mapping is the so-called bills kaufman theorem but maybe it could be generalized to uh, to uh, yeah more general set of functions and finally as i said um, as i said uh, just before the Penlevé 2 hierarchy is generally obtained for recursion uh, due to an operator called the Leonard operator. And it would be really interesting to have uh, to have an integral differential Leonard operator or an operator valued Leonard operator for this. And because uh, because this problem are at the interface of uh, many, many uh, subjects, I'll, and since I have a few minutes, I'll just try to give a, a bonus uh, slide. Uh, I said that the freedom determinants, um, the freedom determinants appear uh, in many problems, including the nonlinear Schrodinger equation or the the KP or the KDV uh, equation. And actually, if you kind of mix the results that I've obtained in integrability between random matrices, uh, Penlevé uh, equations, and integrable uh, PDEs, you can have you can find some funny connections. In particular. Uh, if you want to solve the defocusing on inertia Schrodinger equation, which is the following, and you would start maybe uh, for the initial condition with the solution to the point of V2, but you can see from all these freedom determinant manipulations uh, that you can find explicitly the solution. And the solution in this case is a uh, superluminal uh, soliton. And you can express at any time the solution of uh, the non inertia Schrodinger equation uh, through some kind of uh, dilation of the, of the point of V2 uh, solution. And I think that connecting the dots, one will be able in the future to find a, a lot more of these uh, connections and that can serve either analytically or numerically as a benchmark to improve either algorithm or procedures uh, to obtain uh, all those results. And uh, on this, uh, I'd like to thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be uh, happy to discuss. Thank you, Alexandre. Uh, so everyone can uh, unmute themselves uh, if you want to uh, thank Alexandre uh, and or ask questions.
Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Um, so this case with two different measures, do you have some applications in mind? Um, yes, actually. So um, when you have a single measure, um, in physics we have two interpretations of these freedom determinants. Let's say we talk about uh, we talk about fermions. So uh, when you have a measure, either you can consider fermions at a finite temperature, or you can consider in the same fashion um, a full, uh, some counting statistics of the fermions, which we interpret somehow as a linear statistics of a determinantal point process. Now, if you had two measures, you could consider uh, counting statistics of fermions at finite temperature. So that would be uh, an application. Uh, I have a, a question. Do you expect to, to be able to use uh, the approach to, to obtain asymptotics for the Fredholm determinants? Um, so um, I would say yes. The reason uh, for this is that uh, I'll come back to one slide earlier about KPZ. Uh, on, okay, around KPZ. Um, so Okay, I come from a KPC background, and uh, my interests were originally to find large deviations of uh, the solutions to KPC. But of course, this comes, uh, this is uh, equivalent to study the asymptotics of freedom determinants. And for the freedom determinant related to the KPC uh, equation, uh, Pierre Le Dussel was, uh, was able uh, a few years ago to derive all the asymptotics of the freedom determinant through a clever expansion of the KP equation. But the KP equation, you should somehow also find it uh, through this uh, either closure relation or infinite uh, set of uh, differential uh, equations. So using some kind of uh, clever expansion of this equation, you should be able, I think, uh, to find general expansions. Thank you. I uh, also have a question. Uh, yes. I mean, you mentioned uh, multi-critical fermions a couple of times. What exactly is uh, are they? I mean, uh, you didn't give. A... Um, so the okay, the, the multi-critical uh, fermions. It's a problem of quantum mechanics, uh, mm -hmm. where the where the eigenfunctions uh, where the, the eigenfunctions you try to obtain uh, where are they? Where the eigenfunctions you try to uh, obtain are not uh, the area functions, but are these higher order area functions. So uh, generally, uh, when you have uh, when you have a problem of with uh, fermions, in the bulk of your fermions, you can apply some techniques like uh, the local density uh, approximation. And when you study the local density approximation, generally, uh, you have some uh, some edge for the problem, and there are some universality results for the edge of the problem that always brings you. To some kind of the array function because it has the exponent of the uh, array function. But if you tune the parameter uh, quite nicely, you can have the, the saddle points going to higher and higher order, and then you don't have the array function but higher order array function. So this appears in really in the case where you tune uh, the parameters quite nicely to just have your saddle points go uh, beyond a few more orders. Okay, yeah, I understand. Thanks. Mm. I have a few questions. Um, so I did not uh, get the hypothesis on this sigma function. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, do we need yes. Ah. So yes, it's in zero one. Is it increasing or not? Uh, I take it to be increasing uh, for technical reasons, but I think that uh, Amir Cohen and Kestel on the paper and uh, Thomas Bosner, who has considered this, can have a weaker uh, hypothesis on it. For me, it was just some, for some technicality. I take it to be increasing because I have in mind uh, this Fermi factor, for instance, that increases, or maybe a probability measure. But you can have some uh, discontinuous function, I think, maybe if you want to study uh, freedom mm -hmm. determinants in uh, disjoint intervals. Okay, but uh, so in zero one, this is for eigenvalue reasons, I guess. 
Um, I can, uh, yes, and also uh, the one is also due to the fact that if KS has to be bounded by uh, both by the identity so that the resolvent is defined, I don't want mm -hmm. to go above this because right. I need my resolvent everywhere. So uh, it's, I would say, for technical reasons. And also the reason maybe to take it not to equal to one, but between zero and one mm -hmm. is, uh, is because you can study uh, random matrix ensembles uh, where you just uh, take out some eigenvalues with a certain probability. Okay, okay. Um, in fact, um, so in the example that you gave that generalizes the Amir, Corwin, and Castell uh, uh, result, so you take a function that generalizes the Airy function and that satisfies the fourth order differential equation, right? Yes. So how much does it uh, rely on this uh, on this fact? Does the function a has to solve some? Uh, the yes. Linear? So you have this infinite uh, set of uh, differential equation, but there's one missing ingredient, which is a closure relation that allows you uh, to mm -hmm. go from the higher the q functions to the lower ones. Yes. And to my knowledge, there are only um, two cases where you can close the equation. The first mm -hmm. one being this uh, high order function case. And another mm -hmm. one is for um, freedom determinants that do not have this additive structure, but more like a multiplicative uh, structure, like the Bessel kernel. And mm -hmm. for this, uh, there's a way to define the hierarchy of uh, Bessel kernels, but that's a work in progress. Okay. But these are the only two cases where I know how to close everything. Okay, but so if there is this square and call structure, there is somehow a way to uh, to have a hierarchy uh, automatically from the Fredholm uh, determinant. Hopefully. Ah, hopefully. Okay, but th th there are examples where it's known. Or... You mentioned uh, Bessel kernel, maybe. So, sorry. You said uh, the Bessel kernel, something like this. Yeah. The we know that the Bessel kernel is related to Penlevé 3 or Penlevé 5, depending on how you construct it. So there's also uh, this uh, construction uh, in that case, yes. Okay. That's the, the original mapping between the Bessel kernel and, uh, and the Penlevé equation was done by Tracy and Widom. Okay. Slight question. Uh, you know that you can also do this kind of stuff uh, on the discrete line. Let's say, you know, if maybe you know the Poisson Plancherel measure, this has exactly the same structure. So, you think uh, you can do it also in a discrete setting or with um, uh, different equations instead of differential equations? I would say yes. I haven't really worked on uh, discrete settings. I've mostly, if not only, worked on the continuous case. But uh, mm -hmm. I would say yes, it has to generalize to the discrete case uh, as well. But okay. it's not done, and I don't know anyone that considered this, at least for this generalization. Maybe for a particular case, uh, either Tracy and Widom or Brisa and Kami did it on, for a few cases a long time ago, but more generally, I don't think it has been done. Okay, okay. Ah, uh, yes, can you come back on the slide where you did this Sylvester trick? Uh, I don't understand how you get R+. Plus. Uh, oh yeah, I, oh yeah. I get R plus. The reason for this is that uh, in the definition of my kernel, uh, mm -hmm. the, I integrate over between zero and plus infinity. So the yeah. R plus comes from uh, this integral. Okay, but ah uh, yeah, okay. So you 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 restrict the A S to going to L two of R plus. Oh, this is the stuff I did not understand. Okay. Yeah, okay. Generally, what people do either you consider everything to be an R, but you add an extra projector or uh, a measure. Mm -hmm. Or you just take the integral going from zero to uh, infinity, and you mix between L2 of R and L2 of R plus. Okay. Can you just write quickly the kernel of the the operator on the right hand side? Is it an integral on R? Or an in yeah, that's the integral on R of sigma of uh, x, let's say, a s of x plus uh, blah blah, and a s of x plus blah blah, right? Yes. Yeah, it's an integral of R, and you have the measure sigma. Okay, okay, perfect. I think actually it's written, uh, yeah, it's written here. It's actually like the one that, that I wrote here. Ah, okay, so the, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. So I see. So you get it from the first one like that. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. I have no more questions. Yeah. Are there other questions?
Okay, if not, let's uh, thank uh, Alexandre again. <laughs>